it's a black screen. I can see. Yeah, they, yeah you should be okay oh. Uh, now. Oh, how come I can't see me? You guys <laughs> see me? Are you, mm, I'm making faces at you. Okay, no. All right. So, well, I can't see me. So you guys, I just have to trust you that you can hear me. Well, uh, there's our intro. Hey, happy to see you guys. Welcome to Thursday's Theological Throwdown. Uh, I'm very excited to have our guest return. He is back by popular hand. And, uh, oh, yeah, I see me now. I was being silly. Reminds me of that Monty Python thing. Remember that, uh, uh, Gary, the Monty Python um, TV series? Yes. Used to make the little goose head. <laughs> Correct me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I wanted to let you guys know that this is an open topic night with Gary, but I wanted to... Um, uh, just do a recap of what the Genesis 6 conspiracy is and uh, just at, at least acknowledge the common um, objection to it and whatever is on Gary's heart uh, to explain. And then uh, you guys, I'll let you know when to type in whatever question you have for Gary in all caps when the time comes. Don't do it yet. But uh, Gary... I never asked you this, but you're a contrarian? I am. I'm a Christian contrarian, as I like to call myself. And uh, so a lot of people tend to ask, what do you mean by that? Because there's a few connotations to the, uh, to the phrase contrarian. So what I define a Christian contrarian as is, is, is what my approach is. And that approach is that I tend not to accept uh, anything that somebody says unless I verify it myself and if somebody writes something then I want to verify that so in my research and in my approach to scripture I try and verify everything so I have a better understanding and it's not that I won't accept uh, what somebody might say um, but it has to be consistent but I, I do like to get in behind the scenes and verify it myself so I tend to provide a lot of detail and can back up pretty much everything I say and what I can't, it's my speculation or what I think might happen. So it's uh, kind of in those areas. And I find that it makes your argument on things much more credible. That and, and it's what you're supposed to do. And it's what you're supposed to do. I'm, you know, I don't try and label myself as an expert because I think we're all sort of learning as we go. And we're always adding to that information. And I'm a very curious person. So, um, and my approach allows me to make some adjustments in terms, particularly how I approach scripture. Um, because, again, I don't believe scripture has any contradictions. So, I, I need to have everything fit. And if you get what I think what happens with a lot of people is that they have a preconceived idea. And they're trying to put everything in place to make that preconceived idea make sense and, and come about, so to speak. And I tend to want to let the information tell the story. And that way I don't have to worry about whether or not everything's going to fit or not, because it always does. So those are kind of the two things from a contrarian perspective. And so even within the Christian community, I mean, I talk about giants, which is a contrarian fringe mm -hmm. sort of aspect about scripture so i understand that i understand that there's a lot of people who uh, know a lot about the bible and a lot about scripture so i ought to be able to make my case and make my case convincing enough to somebody who might be staunchly not of my position but mm -hmm. the best that they can do is say well i would agree to disagree but i can't disagree with the points that you're raising so that's right that's, and, and also in terms of how I approach prophecy, and again, there's a lot of people that I think fall into a category, a lot of approaches that are with a predetermined idea. And I think where they go wrong is, is they don't include all of the passages. And I think that they tend to override what Jesus said with what other scripture says instead of vice versa. So if you put everything around what Jesus said on prophecy particularly or any doctrine that he spoke on as the word of God, 
you're going to probably have a lot better chance of understanding and putting things together that make sense that doesn't have con contradictions. Well, I mean, it all pointed to him. And isn't that the reason they couldn't get it? They were still stuck in the shadows. And Paul says, you're complete in him. Mm -hmm. Yep, that makes exactly. Sense. Makes yep. So this Genesis 6 conspiracy is one of those things that, that would come up in the contrary view to, to, but you are able to biblically stand. I certainly uh, agree with you wholeheartedly on this. And I was surprised that my independent fundamental Baptist pastor did recently actually discuss this. I was very, very shocked. Ultra, ultra conservative. You know, a lot of Baptist church were taught the Sethite view. And uh, I'm, I was going to ask you, I was going to hand it to you. Would you just explain for anybody that might not know what the Genesis 6 conspiracy sure. is and what usually they're taught about it? Well, uh, I think I'll start at the at the end and, and sort of work back on that just so that okay. I can underline what you were saying. And, you know, it's nice to have some ministers who aren't going to totally follow everything that they were taught in seminary schools because they're taught in seminary schools not to recognize the Bible in a completely literal way or the passages that would support giants. And they don't want the ministers talking about giants and they don't want them talking about a whole lot about prehistory. But as long as you're talking about prehistory and it hasn't got anything to do with giants, that's kind of okay. But what you can't do after that is talk about prophecy. And so in, in seminary schools, prophecy and prehistory are downplayed. And so they're given in seminary schools the doctrines and the dogma that they're to teach. And, and most because everybody wants to follow, you know, the rules and the regulations and, and not be sort of out in the fringe areas, they're not going to challenge back on that. So it's a refreshing to, to hear you say that there's a few ministers out there that, you know, do understand that. And, and there's more than a few. So there's, but it's not the common doctrine uh, of, of churches. So with that in mind, and with what I said previously, the controversy over the Genesis 6 conspiracy, as I like to call it, is what happens in Genesis 6 as a manifestation of the angelic rebellion and what the fallen angels are going to do in response to um, failing in the first rebellion and then seeing that God has created the Adamites, humankind, to be raised higher than angels or equal to angels in the in in the future time and i say that because we're actually going to judge these fallen angels according to scripture for probably what i would think are the crimes against humanity and so that's what genesis 6 really is all about is after Satan gets his first revenge in Eden on Adam. He takes his second revenge out by having and leading and persuading his fallen angels who have rebelled with him, a certain number of them, to take human wives in the physical world and take a physical form and to create offspring. And these are going to be the giants. And that's the Hebrew word nephil and nephilim, if people are familiar with the term, is the, is the male plural. And these were the giant ones. And it's rooted in nephal, which is the fallen ones, but it's not the word that's used there, it's nephil. So, and that's the giants as it's defined. And, and that's not an exaggeration, that is the literal definition, a tribe of giants, a tribe of tyrants. And any of the descriptions we get about the giants there in the Bible, attest to that these were not just seven foot tall beings, they, these were monsters. And these, these Nephilim are created to lead humankind away from God and to lead them into oblivion so that humankind will not receive their destiny through the resurrection to become like angels and to judge the, the rebellious angels. So that's the conspiracy, is the creation of the giants to uh, destroy humankind. And that's, you know, why I have the, uh, uh, the subtitle to the Genesis 6 conspiracy book. It's, you know, it's the, you know, the descendants of 
secret societies and giants um, want to enslave humankind. That's exactly what they've been doing ever since Genesis 6 before the flood. So let me ask you this. Why is it that you, you said two things? You said one, they, as in seminaries, like the majority of seminaries don't want you to know or talk about Genesis 6 giants and they don't want you to talk about them in regards to prophecy. Why is that? Well, I mean, a couple of things. Uh, but the basis is to understand what I had said about why these giants were created. What they did was they, they usurped the kingships and control of the world and they set up their royal dynasties and the dynasties were the greater noble elite which which would be their relatives and that's been the feudal class that's been there since the beginning and part of that hierarchical organizational structure that was set up before the flood was the Enochian mysticism, and that's I'm referring to Enoch, son of Cain, here, as opposed to Enoch, son of Jared, who had set up the mystical religions and the sun worshiping bull cult that was the religion that led humankind astray before the flood. And it's that organizational structure of the giants and the mystical religion and the knowledge that they develop and the partnership with the Cainites and the partnership with the fallen angels that paraded the antediluvian world into destruction in the first apocalypse by, by water. So this is the same organizational structure and same beings that crosses the flood. And they reset up their dynasties and the complete ruling elite, the complete noble class. And that noble class controlled for themselves to keep the mundane humans poor and in servitude the ruling elite that was in control of the education, that were provided the teachers, that provided the priests and the ministers, and who were the ruling kings and queens through throughout history. So what they don't want you to know by understanding the giants is who they are, and that they keep these genealogies on file and record to substantiate themselves within their culture as to where they fit in the hierarchy and that they don't want you to know about prophecy because they want you to be more easily deceived in the end time because they want to bring about this destiny this this rendezvous with destiny with god and because they believe you know, from the fallen angels who they follow that they can win and win a realm on their own. So they want to deceive humankind to rebel against the God of the Bible. And so they need to control this information so that you're more easily deceived. So if you get into the prophecy now, you know, you get a couple of terms that should create red flags for people out of the New Testament. One would be is the great delusion that the second thessalonians is talking about and then the other one is what jesus talks about is that even the elect will be deceived and that's the, the deception that they're setting up to have people believe that jesus is not the messiah and their dragon messiah that they're going to present is the real messiah and they're going to have things like counter armageddon complete to complete the uh, deception so they have to control that information otherwise more people won't be deceived or less people will be just uh, will be deceived is a better way of putting it and so controlling the information until they want it out is one of their tactical mo's and they're going to release a little bit more as we go but it's never going to be all of the information and it's going to be designed to deceive so literally, you they don't want you talking about grandpa. Like somewhere down the line, this these elite, powerful leaders, even today, can trace their lines back. Some of these can, can't they? Or at least they believe sure. they can. Yeah, well, then they can because they've got geneal genealogists. And, uh, you know, there was a fellow who wrote a number of books and I use them 
um, as some of the sourcing in, in, in the Genesis 6 conspiracy book, uh, Lawrence Gardner, he was a royal genealogist for mm. certain families, right? And they have these people that, you know, maintain these records. And so the when you look at the genealogies, uh, I can provide an example, I think, that will at least give people a glimpse into how important it is for them. So Prince Charles, um, son of Queen Elizabeth, says that he is related to Vlad the Impaler, the individual that the Dracula uh, store, uh, novel was, uh, was written uh, on his character. And Vlad the Impaler is sort of your typical noble Celt, and he had red hair and hazel eyes and very pale skin and was educated at the uh, School of Solomon in Vienna and a Scythian by descent that goes back to what they believe are the Rephaim tribe of Danu, uh, which also is also known as the uh, Tuatha Dodanan, that is the ruling giants after the flood. And the only way that Prince Charles can state that is, A, he could be lying, but more likely, because they do keep these genealogies, is that he knows through his genealogical line that he is related to Vlad the Impaler, and for people who may not be aware of it, the, the Windsors, they changed their name in World War I um, to the name of Windsors, and they're actually the Hanover family. So when you look at King George, um, I think was uh, uh, for the, uh, for the, at the time of the American Revolution, he's the first Hanover king that replaced the, uh, the uh, Stuart kings. And dynasties. So that's where those genealogies will go back through in one of those branches back to Germany and then back to uh, the various houses of the Germanic and Slavic houses, you know, up and down the Danube River. So they keep those genealogies because it is where they fit in the hierarchy. And the more ennobled those bloodlines are and the more pure those bloodlines are is the higher up those houses are rated. And you need to understand that so you can understand the noble elite and the secret societies because they kind of work hand in hand and they're dominated and governed by the Masonic royal houses or the royal masons um, that oversee the top end of the hierarchy and use organizations like the Rosicrucians and the Illuminati below them and the Freemasonry below them and then all the branch organizations coming into that trunk as you go up that tree or that hierarchy of the tree. And you need to understand that it's the royals and their Masonic organizations like, you know, let's say the Swedish one because it's it's got a, and the Norse one, it's because it's got a name that might ring a bell with people and they're called the Knights of the Seraphim. That's because the seraphim are the watchers that produced the original Nephilim both before and after the flood. I fall into a, a second uh, uh, incursion preference for how giants show up uh, uh, after the flood, although I recognize we don't have a smoking gun as to how they show up. We only know that they do show up. But the evidence to me tends to suggest instead of survival, which the polytheists believe, uh, I think there's a second incursion, but that's that's another rabbit hole, and uh, we we can go down that if people want to know more about that, uh, they can ask a question from the chat room. Yeah, uh, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about too. But to confirm what you said, I remember reading about Prince Philip and how you know they they up and I mean it's strange for one of the royals to marry someone that's not. Uh, in another royal family, where Prince Philip, were they Greece? I think it was Greece. His parents were the king and queen of Greece or something. Yeah. And then they got kicked out because yep. they became a republic or something. So I remember they couldn't marry who they wanted, even though they were high and they were nobility, because uh, she was queen or destined to be, uh, then she couldn't marry who she wanted to marry. And they had to remain married to other royals and and then it is for that bloodline but you don't realize that right is that what's going on yeah and they'll only reach out when they need to replenish 
the DNA and the bloodline so that they keep the bloodline diseases um, at a manageable uh -huh. level like hemophiliac disease or Habsburg jaw. And there's a reason why, you know, Habsburg jaw again sort of gives that visual with the, you know, Habsburg dynasty and they were not, you know, taking in bloodlines that, you know, were a little bit further out and distance from them and they actually, you know, they developed their own disease from it. So uh, it's, it's important to understand that and that you do get, you know, instances like Prince Harry and where that's not working out very well uh, right now where they're, they don't, you know, the ones who are not going to be taking power don't have to have as pure of bloodlines um, to marry into, and that helps with a regeneration of the of the bloodline, and that's why over the time, because they have to regenerate that, they tend to have lost some of the attributes of their ancestors, because mm. they have to continue to replenish uh, the blood with with uh, uh, less pure blood, but not through the direct uh, scions, and so they really have to work and plan those intermarriages for the ones who are going to lead the families, right? So that they can continue. And those genealogies will dictate where they fit in with those select sort of aboriginal branches and, and, and families. There were 12, I, th I think it was 12, uh, of Queen Elizabeth's direct cousins in uh, adult homes for... Um, uh, I'm going to say mentally disabled, you know, like childlike, childlike IQ. They're functional, but more, you know, at a childlike level. There were so many defects. I had never seen a family have that many in the immediate, like, I mean, yeah. they were like first cousins and yeah. just so many of them. Uh, and they were really adorable because they would see her on TV and they would have their little uh, you know, pictures of her and the teddy bears. And there were so many of them, uh, I, I couldn't believe it. But what you're saying there makes perfect, like, scientific sense that you can only, uh, there's going to be mutations and they're going to continue if there's mutations on both sides. And then as it goes on, there's mutations on four sides and then eight sides and it, it will continue. So uh, I still, you know, it's so, Wow because you don't think about these things in modern day, you know, that people would uh, think about the uh, marrying for those reasons yeah. today. Yeah. It's really important. Uh, well, and I didn't yeah, know. it's important. And, you know, if you look at Prince Philip, who, you know, just died recently and, you know, he didn't play a prominent role from the visible aspect with Queen Elizabeth, you know, running the, the, the family and the throne. He's not this somebody that was, as he's kind of portrayed, that was outside the bloodline. He's the grandson of Queen Victoria. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but you don't hear that. And so unless you understand or dig into the genealogies, you're, you're not going to pick up on any of that. So it's all, like I say, it's designed to keep those bloodlines pure, but it comes with a risk in terms of the diseases that, you know, they have to find a balance on it. And not only are people, they're looking for matches right from birth, but everybody in the royal families, whether or not they're the, let's say the Windsor family or they're uh, part of the cousins or distant cousins, when you're part of the bloodlines, when you're born, you are assigned a specific role. Everybody in the bloodlines has their own agenda that they're um, provided to work within the hierarchy. So their lives are all right from childhood and they're initiated into the mysteries from childhood. They're not initiated mm. through Freemasonry and then go to, the, I mean, they're an adept by the time they're, they're in their teens and they, they go to a lot higher levels and they're not allowed to be called an adept until they're somewhere between 25 and 30 uh, when they can actually accept that title. So they, they are born into this. They are initiated, they are trained, they are taught, they are prepared through their whole lives to carry out the role that they've been assigned to make the whole thing continue to work because 
no, I mean, a lot of people think today that they don't control what's going on in the world. You just don't see them. They've got more puppets mm -hmm. out in front that are care and doing their bidding, um, but they're still running things and they have the real money and none of that money is on the books. Did you know, I, I think I, we may have mentioned this, I'm not sure, but somebody had done research on the American presidents because we all think we vote them in. And every one of them is related to European royalty, even Obama. He was related to them as well. And they're all they're all related to the royal families over there. Yeah. So, and and I think I think what they found was Obama went through a, a different lineage than the European lineage, but the the principle yeah, the is royal. still the same. So and the family that all of them right up to the time of uh bush took their their were you know the nexus point back in history is king john plantagenet mm. brother of king richard the lionheart john of the magna carta plantagenet of the branch family that comes out of the anjou they so are that was one of the old families yes Oh, wow. Wow. But what's weird to me is that we, as the people, but so even if we do vote them in, you only have two choices and they both come from the same bloodlines. So Yes, or they, they are going to work all the political parties to try and always have their people who are carrying water for them or if they're going to lead it. Uh, and have a significant role will probably be part of the bloodlines, even if, if it's distant and or they're going to be, well, both ways, but if they were not part of the bloodlines, they're committed to the system and they're going to be permitted to have their offspring intermarry into the bloodlines through so that over the generations, their offspring is going to have a higher position in, in the world. So they like to control the parties and every once in a while, you have somebody who comes along that sort of disrupts that whole thing. And then you can see the whole system rise up against them. I'm not sure we have anybody of recent history. I say that sort of tongue in cheek where the whole system rose up against uh, President Trump. But you can see oh. the reaction of everything that is controlled by these families when they see that they don't have somebody who they want in power. I'm as, I'm actually surprised he got into office because of all, I mean, nobody, those people did not want him there. He's not one of, he's not in those, nobody that I know could find a society he was a, a link to. Yep. Well, and, and he, he, you know, he comes out of the Democratic Party. I mean, he switched parties more I know. convenience. <laughs> um, and, so whatever his motivations are, I mean, and no matter how he acted, I mean, his policies for Christians and for freedom were good. Um, and he was standing up against the powers of the world. I mean, the Europeans absolutely hated him. Not the average okay. European. The European bloodlines absolutely mm -hmm. hated him. The media absolutely hated him. The banks hated him. The corp oligarchical corporations hated him. The whole world rose up against him. And there, I think they're still stinging from what, how he got elected and that if they had not created a scenario in this last election, he would have been reelected again. And I when I so. say the scenario, I'm talking about all of the scenarios, like, you mm -hmm. know, right from the media to the high tech to the covering of stories to the persecution to the, the, the elections, and, you know, everything. And they still almost didn't mm -hmm. get, get him elected, uh, prevented him from being elected. And, you'll, and that's why you're never going to see a proper audit an investigation that's objective on the election or any of the 5,000 um, sworn affidavits on, on the corruption, you're never going to see it. They will not permit it. It's it's crazy because they tell us that it's an open book for the people, by the people. All, it's not. Yeah. It's not. And, 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 and that it, is. And, and, if, and if people want to know why the Supreme Court didn't take it, 
And, you know, they, they said beforehand they couldn't do it because there wasn't standing because there's been no crimes been broken and it has to come up through the courts. And then after uh, and during the election, they said, well, we have to wait till a certain date, which was when Biden was um, uh, sworn in. And then we'll have a look at it. Then they said, we, we're not going to look at it at all. They're told not to look at it. You know, England said, I don't know if it was the prime minister. England said Trump was not allowed to visit their country or something like a yep. couple years ago, yep. right when he was elected. Yep. I mean, did that yep. still stand? I mean, could they really do that? Have another country say that, I mean, that's a diss to, to, to the office, not just to him, but to the office of president. Even if you don't like the president's there, you're supposed yep. to respect the office of it as a representative of the country. So it was just very bizarre that they would say that you know yeah. the public he's there he's not and he can't come that we don't want him in our country that was that was intense yes. but i i want i'm glad you you mentioned that because i i wanted people to see how what you put so much of your life into is affecting their lives a lot of people might think you know well it's you know it's interesting but it, it doesn't affect me or, or, you know, that was a long time ago. And so it's important uh, to, to see how this, how this is affecting us all. Yeah. And, and you get some tidbits through history and there's a, pro, there's a prime minister uh, in Canada called Mackenzie King and he was prime minister during world war two. And he wrote a lot of diaries and things and they've kind of made these things sort of disappear um, but he wrote that every time they had a high level cabinet meeting and they were going to make decisions, there was an unnamed person who used to sit in and uh, they would decide what they're going to do. Then they would turn to this individual and he would say yes or no. The governments, uh, you, you, have, you have to understand the governments are doing what they're told to do. Uh, and have a parameter that they can work in, but for the large decisions, they're going to basically have to ask permission, can we do this or can we not do that? So if you're looking now at the Biden government and you're looking at him to challenge China or Russia or anything like that, unless he's given permission, he, pro he probably won't do it. I don't think Trump listened to them and he did what he wanted to do for good or for bad. Uh, and I'll let people decide that on their own, but he seemed to be his own man. I'm sorry, Gary. I had my uh, mic still open and when I was yelled at the dog. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, somebody in the chat was, uh, I guess they're new and maybe not familiar with the root of this conversation. Uh, I want Gary to explain that to you, but uh, it, this is about the Genesis 6 verse, and he'll explain that verse, and how that conspiracy that happened back then, uh, how it affected the world in the past, as well as now and probably in the future in regards to who these ruling elite are. So uh, I will uh, ask Mr. Gary to go back to the actual Genesis 6 conspiracy sure. and give a rundown of it, if you don't mind, sir. So again, the, the Genesis 6 conspiracy obviously begins in Genesis 6, and in the first four verses, of Genesis 6, 1 through 4, you get this narrative that is part of the flood story. It's actually a preamble to the flood story. It sets the context to the flood story. And most people don't connect that, but there's nothing to separate the creation of these giants in Genesis uh, 6, 1 through 4 from Noah's commission and then the flood story. So it's part of the flood story. And what happens is the sons of God, who are uh, called the watchers in some apocryphal books like Enoch uh, and others, are, the, are angels who are the governing angels of the earth reporting to Satan because Satan is the god of this world but in terms of their hierarchy they are the watchers they are the governors they go to human females and they select wives and procreate with them 
and create offspring who are called giants in the King James Version Bible and other English translations that will say Nephilim. These are the giant ones. These, this is the giant people, and they are the demigods of prehistory. And these demigods usurp the kingships around the world. And they control all of the government and all of the armies and they control the religion and it's a part of an organizational structure that we talked about previous about the setting up to the mystical religions by Enoch son of Cain and the Canaanites are part of the partnership and of course the fallen angels. And so they're setting up this organizational structure to parade the world into the first apocalypse by water, which is why you get the Genesis uh, six story of the giants as a preamble to the flood. This organization and people cross the flood. And I think by a second incursion by fallen angels, and those fallen angels would have gone to the abyss as well as, as um, Second Peter and uh, Jude talk about. And you have these giants and the religion that is passed on to them that is going to set up the same organizational structure after the flood. And this becomes the noble elite, the complete ruling class. So if you look around the world, you basically have a four class system. And in the West, we had kind of the feudal system. So it's the same setup all around the world. So you have the ruling class, the princes and the nobles and the cousins and the expanded sort of elite. And then you have the priest class who are running all of the religions. And then you have a small business merchant class, and then you have the serfdom class, or the ones who do all the labor, or the slaves, and it's the same setup all around all, all around the world, and only broken to a certain degree in the last couple hundred years in the West, but everywhere else it, it, it remains. So this is the system that has come down uh, to the world, and the royals and the people who run the world they keep these genealogies that go back to these fallen angels, a specific fallen angel and a specific offspring of the fallen angels, both before and after the flood, because they believe in their belief system that giants survived the flood. Uh, whereas I believe they were recreated again after the flood. Whatever way you believe, it, it ends up in, in sort of the same sort of direction. And they're the, they're the ones that are controlling the world today and are trying to bring about the end time so that they can have this rendezvous with destiny and have a war with God because they believe that they can win and have their own realm away from God. So it's important to understand who they are and what they're doing and what they're going to try and brainwash us with in preparation for this rebellion that people are going to uh, be asked to participate in and for the preparation to bring about the Antichrist and deceive people into following him and in replace of Jesus. So hopefully, um, I you know, it was kind of a long answer, but I'm kind of hoping Sorry, that, <laughs> no, it was perfect. that and I <laughs> encapsulated it for the this. person. So, yep. I was actually starting to answer you, but my, but now this time my mic was off. So <laughs> <laughs> talking at the wrong time tonight. Um, so hopefully the gentleman in the, the chat room that gives you some background here, the uh, fallen angels and their rebellion, uh, mated with human beings, the daughters of men, as Genesis 6 says, their offspring, their children became giants and were massive. We're not talking about just Goliath, but way, way, way bigger. Uh, we can talk about the size of some of them tonight. Uh, but now we're tracing our modern day elite, powerful ruling families that rule over finances, the financial institutions, you know, the banking systems and uh, world everything, uh, just have their hands in every pot, how it traces back to this event because they uh, associate their their ancestry with these very beings that are, like he explained, are rebellion yep. to God. So hopefully you'll get that that's the foundation and, of where we're going. And a good example in terms of how it relates to America and the bloodlines and 
we have to be in also understanding that when we see more of the visible ones today that are out in front, they're just, you know, working for as an avatar uh, for the people pulling the, street, uh, the strings in the background. So if you look at the Rockefellers or the Carnegie's or the JP Morgan's or any of the famous uh, pseudo blue bloods in North America, they were sponsored by the Rothschilds and mm. provided the money to uh, be set up because they're the stable of agents for the, the European families that work in North America. And so in North America, everybody funnels through these bloodlines and then they've been intermarrying uh, with their offspring into the bloodlines uh, as a reward for their servitude to the Rothschilds. And, uh, you know, they're very respectful and thankful because they actually put them in the business. So the Rothschilds are part of the secret societies. They're not the ones that are part of the super elite, though. They're, they were actually the Bauer family out of Germany after a time after the Templars fell. They, the Royal Masons needed to reset up the banking arm outside of the church. And so they funded and sponsored the Bauer family in Germany to start setting up banking and to lend money and to uh, lend money you know, for wars and things like that. And they changed their name to the Rothschilds when they set up the London Bank. And so they've been intermarrying and ennobling themselves over the last three to 400 years. So to sound uh, less ethnic? What's that? They change your last name to sound less ethnic or? What? Yeah, they, they, they wanted to um, distance themselves from a Germanic and a Jewish I name. See. And they changed it to the Red Shield, which is an allegory for, you know, the Mark of Cain in, in their belief uh, system. So. Wow. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about that tonight, but I don't want to get you off too on the. Well, let me write that note. Uh, I, I, viewers, I wanted to ask you. I, I just got a text here. Uh, we have two of our beloved brothers and sisters in the hospital tonight. Uh, I got a text from uh, Nicholas. He said he's uh, going to be out and he's feeling better, but he harmed himself at work. He's in Canada as well, and Stephanie, uh, our beloved sister is in the hospital right now. Please pray for both of them tonight and continue to pray for them uh, in their recovery. Uh, we, we, we hate it when, uh, when any part of the body is hurt, we're all affected. So we need to bear one another's burdens, thus fulfilling the law of Christ. But I wanted to, uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here, but you were mentioning the uh, Rothschilds and somebody had asked about the Rockefellers and oh the avatar that's what you were talking about there because when you're talking i'm making notes of what to pops up to ask you on what you just discussed and that was the avatar now would you explain what an avatar is to everyone what the, what that means yeah there's two concepts that they they've been really working on and introducing to the west uh, through movies and the movie avatar in particular it's an ancient concept. It typically comes out of, in terms of that exact wording, out of uh, the Hindu religion and Buddhism. And an avatar is a fallen angel or a god. The avatara is a human being. And so what an avatar does is it enters the body of the avatara. And there's a symbiotic relationship. It's similar to possession, but mm. the host is asking for um, the fallen angel to do it. And usually it, uh, the fallen angel will provide wisdom, strength, power, that sort of as a, a, a reward versus a demon spirit that's not symbiotic. And the host hasn't asked it and there's a war, asked for it and there's a war going on. So in Vishnu, was the avatar for Buddha, mm. just as Shiva had a number of uh, avatars as well. Both of them had, you know, have what they 
and you'll again you'll hear this word over and over and over. They call us an incarnation. Ah, okay. And so with the end time antichrist, uh, Lord Maitreya is one of the names oh. out of the east, which is the new Buddha, and that he will be an avatar of either Satan or Azazel. I think uh, it could be uh, either, but I think Satan fits better because you have in Revelation 13 that all the power comes from Satan and gives uh, Antichrist the power. So I think he's going to be the avatar. And we have an example in the Bible of Satan being an avatar or an avatar for an avatar. In the time of Jesus, when Judas is looking to betray Jesus, he is struggling with this and he needs help. And that's when Satan enters into him mm. and gives him that strength to get over the hump to betray uh, Jesus. I think he actually, this is my speculation as well. I think there's another case in the Bible where Satan enters another being. In this case, I would say it was the serpent in uh, Eden, mm -hmm. the Nahash, because mm -hmm. the Nahash or the serpent did not lose its legs, did not lose its speech, did not lose its arms, wasn't forced to crawl on the ground. Satan, none of that happened to Satan. It all happened to the serpent. And so if, the, if Satan deceived Eve, as a lot of people believe, or had sex with her, then he would have been the one that was punished. And Satan did not go to the abyss like the other impassioned fallen angels. So he wouldn't have been, you know, the father of Cain, as a lot of people think as well. And I have a terrific four-part series that walks through this in absolute detail. If you want to know why the story has trouble uh, scripturally, uh, that Satan is the father of Cain. I don't say that it's impossible but the i don't see is, I, I yeah, see the scripture that. doesn't seem to support that case but i know and i know there's a lot of people who, who will disagree with that but if you want a blow by blow uh, detailed um analysis of, of the serpent seed doctrine just get a hold of me through my website i'll send you that four-part series and i think you'll find it very very informational so that's the second time where i think satan was an avatar so we have to be careful with that with those those words that they're preparing us for, and that Antichrist will be in, in incarnation, just as Aslan in the uh, Narnia tale is an incarnation, and Aslan, as he's called, is a Jesus like person if Jesus went to another world, so an incarnation into a lion. Now, what's interesting about what Lewis did there was he took an Eastern concept, masked it as a Christian-like concept, and there's actually a lion demigod in, in, in Indian history, subcontinent of Indian history, called Narashima. Hmm. And Narashima is this lion god, or demigod would be more accurate. And this was one of the incarnations of Shiva, who would be the equivalent to Azazel in um, the Judeo-Christian um, accounting of coming out of the book of Enoch in terms of naming Azazel as the destroyer god. And so you have to be careful with the propaganda and the language that they're preparing everybody for to accept the great delusion that even the elect will be deceived in the end time and how so and how and why so many people will accept antichrist as the true messiah reject jesus including people within the church because he will have a resurrection he will have a counterfeit Armageddon. They will counterfeit everything because that's what they've done right from the beginning with their yep. angelic rebellion. Yeah, absolutely. I will be like the most high. Yeah. That's what he's always Isaiah 14. To yep. I, I agree. I agree with you on the Cain issue. I but you know, like how I say if people disagree on something, but you can see it clearly in the scriptures, I got no problem with it. But what I see in the scriptures is that it's clear that she, 
she knew her husband and Cain was born and that she had received him from the Lord. So uh, I have an issue with that. It also takes literal things in Genesis and turns them allegorical, which I don't agree with on that. But, you know, it's not foundational. And and, and as you you go down in Genesis 4 there, the same language is used for the birth of um, Enoch, son of Cain. And then the same language is used for the birth of Seth. And a lot of people will say, well, Seth's lineage is in Genesis 5. And why, if they're of the same, you know, parents, then why wouldn't they be together? Of course they're together. You have Seth being born in Genesis 4. And then you get the complete lineage in Genesis 5. But they like to ignore the inconvenient passages. So if the language, my point is if the language is, is exactly the same for those three in Genesis 4, then you would have to say then that Cain, Enoch, son of Cain, and Seth were also offspring of Satan. And But Christians don't tend to say that. The Gnostics right. say that, sure. but not do they? the Christians who believe in the serpent seed. But the Gnostics do because they believe the complete Cain line were all giants and that Noah was a giant and his lineage was giants as well so of course they're going to say that that's bizarre it is i didn't know that i looked but in, what I it does, a, but what it, but what it does for them is it contaminates the the uh, seth line and and the descendants of noah thereafter crossing uh, the flood right uh yeah, I, I, you know, I was recently researching just a taste of it when I was studying uh, the book of Colossians on our Wednesday night Bible study over on CES. We were going over some of the re- refuting of the things that were being taught, the voluntary humility, worshiping of angels. So I went back to the first century Gnostics and found that they have some bizarre, like bizarre teachings. So yeah. that, that, surprised me but it didn't at the same time but i have yeah. i've only touched base on that i haven't gone deep into it but uh yeah that's a, a strange teaching but i believe it i believe well, they do they they do and also it was appropriate at the time that i look at those passages that you were referencing to is they were referencing the essenes which were the third circle yes. of, the, of the judaic society along with the pharisees and the sadducees from the religious perspective right. and the Essenes would not give up the names of the angels they worshipped even upon death. And everything that they're talking about in that whole series of things are what the Essenes practiced. So I think Paul was talking about the Essenes. Yes, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. There were uh, the teachings of the Essenes mixed with Jewish philosophy uh, of the Essenes uh, and mixed with Gnosticism. Yes. There was all kinds of stuff I was researching there. It is fascinating. But when you said they didn't give up the angels they worshiped upon fear of de- uh, upon death, threat of yep. death, what, what do you mean by that? They, they had names for the angels. And you'll note that in the Bible, we don't get a lot of names of angels. We get two. Uh, and, and we don't even have Satan's name, although I think KLL would be his name as, as Isaiah 14, 12 has... Uh, Lucifer in the King James Version Bible, which is an Italian word for the Hebrew word Hail L, and typically angels' names end in E-L, whether it's Azazel out of Enoch or um, Michael or Gabriel or Uriel, you know, that's um, in the Apocrypha of the Old King James Version Bible, or Raphael would be another one. So those are the only names that that, that we get. So, um, yeah, there you got Enoch, Uriel. Yeah. We got uh, Enoch angels all in Danel yeah. also. Yeah. 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 So, and somebody might say, well, Semyaza doesn't, but that's a corruption. Uh, I've got a document on that as well. That's actually Azazel. Is it? <laughs> yeah. So, there, you think it's the same person and that one is. is actually yep. a description or a title or something? Yep. Yeah, I'm right. Yeah. And actually, you know, uh, Yaza is sort of a polytheist word for a fallen angel, and Shem is uh, 
from the uh, Hebrew word is connected to Shem in the Bible, but there's a root world, uh, which is the word for heaven, which is uh, Shema, uh, and Shem is the singular formal. And the word Shemaim is the plural of Shema, as in I am with the plural, and that's the heavenly ones. So that when it's talking about the heavenly ones, you're going to see that term used in, 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 in the original Hebrew. And so when you look at Shemiaza, that's the singular for, form. And then you've got a Zen word as it actually uh, is believed in, in, in polytheism. That's sort of added on. But they were somehow separated through the corruptions of Enoch down the line. There's a few corruptions in Enoch. We don't have an original complete Hebrew manuscript of Enoch. I think it runs 99% uh, consistent with the Bible, but there's a few issues in there. And again, I have a document on some of those inconsistencies if people want it. And I'm not dismissing Enoch because I like it a lot. Last time, me too. The fir first Enoch, of course. Is, first uh, Enoch, yep. Yeah, that's, well, you know, is quoted word for word. Is it in Jude? Jude quotes yep. him, right? It's yep. that book. And so, I think there's truth to it. I think it's actually, there's truth to it. And the only reason I think it's important to actually read it and get acquainted with it is because I believe all the first century Jewish converts and even some of the Gentile converts would have known the story. They would have uh, known and had Enoch in the back of their mind in the context of understanding these letters. Like when, when Jude wrote these things and Peter wrote, you know, taking vengeance on them. So I think they would have uh, understood it pr correctly. And I can't find any reference because I, I, I want to defend this it, it, because it constantly comes up. I can't find any reference to other teachings on Genesis 6 other than what the truth of it is. And nobody seemed to have a problem with it saying what it means and meaning what it say, says. Uh, in the early church, uh, you know, right, right around the apostles time, everybody just accepted is, yep, that's what happened. So, I mean, it was common knowledge. Uh, even Josephus mentions having the, um, is it a Malachite that he had on display at 21 foot tall skeleton they had in the first century on display. So uh, and this was the Titans. These were the Greek and Roman gods. So everybody knew where the, these uh gods came from they were uh demi half god half human and everybody was aware of it but yep. you know i can't find the teaching like today where they're claiming sad good believers and non-believers have these gen when, when we say genetic anomalies that it does not even begin to <laughs> touch it because i this is why i mentioned this because i i want people to understand not just the strange manifestations most of them had, but some of them had really crazy things like one eye and fangs and stuff, and double rows of teeth, six fingers, six toes. But these things were beyond massive. I, I want Gary to explain to us what the first incursion of giant has been reported to have been like, what they sounded like, how tall they were, just get an idea of what these things were because there was no teaching on Genesis 6 other than the truth up until the recent church sometime. And I'm sure Gary would know that when yeah. this teaching began about that it wasn't really the sons of God. Uh, you've, got, was, you, you, so you've, gonna... you've got a couple of church fathers that were struggling with the aspect of recognizing that the angels created these giants and that there was these things that were not quite human and then they debated it and they struggled with that but the majority of church fathers accepted that these were giants and it was the standard teaching within christianity up until um a couple hundred years ago um when two things happened when the jesuits got control of the seminary teachings and universities of of the catholic church and outside the catholic church the gnostics 
took over control of the seminary schools and Christianity. So they got control of that information and they started to teach the Sethite doctrine. At the time of Josephus, it was the standard doctrine all around the world about gods procreating with human females to create demigod, which is the ancient definition of a demigod is the offspring of a god and a human female and they were giants and there were giants all around the world it's the same story written about all over the world so if you go into greek mythology poseidon uh you know mates with a human female climbing climbing he creates uh 10 nephilim king offspring which are also called heroes and titans because they can be titans of the heavens and titans of the earth and atlas would be a classic case of being called both that's the atlantean empire which is why it's so popular in western cultures because that was the helm of world government and the golden age that was trying to take over the whole world so that's why you have the reference to the new ages also being the new atlantis that they that they want to bring about and so if we look at what these things looked like in their size, Josephus said that these bones that were on display were completely of a different kind and structure of a human. And that they just awed people in their size and the differences of that bone structure. And you would need it to support the size of these beings. They weren't seven feet tall. They weren't eight feet tall they were much larger than that and we don't get in the bible an accounting of how tall they were we do in enoch but it's sort of um we don't know what an l what the dimension of an l is so when we we see 300 uh, L's as it's translated in one of the translations of, of Enoch. In another one, it's translated as cubits. A cubit would get them to be like 450 feet tall if you're using a common cubit versus a royal cubit of 21 inches. So I think they're a lot smaller than that. Uh, the general sort of conclusion with the, with the information that we have is, is that they were thought to be 20 to 40 or 50 feet tall. Some people might say as tall as 100 feet. Uh, I think they're using the reference in um, the book of Amos where they're the Amorites, which are hybrids, they weren't purebred Rephaim or Nephilim, they're hybrids, um, were as tall as the cedars in Lebanon. Well, they grew to be about 100 feet tall and about 40 feet wide, but that's an allegory, it's a simile. So you, again, you have to be careful with that. But the general consensus is 20 to 40 feet tall. Um, and these were the terrible ones, both before and after the flood, as talked about in Isaiah and Ezekiel. And in Isaiah 25, as, as I recall the passage, you have the strong ones. That goes back to the Hebrew word um, um, as, which means strong, as in stout, because they were thought to be uh twice as wide as the average human. So where a typical human would have a height to width ratio of three to one, they had a two to one ratio. And that's where the stout word comes in. So they were extraordinarily wide. And we don't know, we don't have, um, unless you look at perhaps Gilgamesh, but I think he's, he's, he's created after the flood and he's certainly not on the on the Ark in the Epic of Gilgamesh as Upmatishan is, so he could be much bigger than Gilgamesh. But Gilgamesh is, is I think, part of the second incursion, just as Enkidu is as well. And Gilgamesh is 11 cubits tall, so that's going to be 16 feet and, and some change using 18 inches, or because he was the king of Uruk, he would have been measured on a royal cubit, which would have taken him to about 19 feet tall. So the weight of these things that were thought to be, you know, using Goliath, uh, not Goliath, but um, Gilgamesh, they would have been like 3,000 pounds. I mean, these were monsters. And even in the time of after the flood with the Raphaim, which are seemingly from scriptural accounts, the distinction of the post-Diluvian giants as opposed to the Nephilim of the antediluvian or before the flood giants, the Raphaim, um, you have an account with King Og, who's the last of the Raphaim, the last of the giants. The word giant 
um, goes back to the word Rafa. Raphaim is the male plural again. And just so that people don't get lost here, Nephilim is only used three times in in the Bible for giant. That's once in Genesis 6, uh, 4, and then twice in the same verse in Numbers 13, 33. And that's part of the bad report. And I'm not saying that that discounts all the giants because the Anakim um, were actually Raphaim as they're described in Deuteronomy 2 where the word giant goes back to Raphaim. So the Nephilim are before the flood, Raphaim are after the flood. Og is the last of the giants, last of the Raphaim, and his bed is going is uh, nine cubits uh, in, in terms of length. So that bed is going to be anywhere from 14 to 16 feet, but because he was a king, it would be a royal cubit, and a cubit uh, as provided to us by Josephus at that time was 21 inches for the royalty. Um, you get a, a few varying degrees of royal cubits, uh, to, you know, uh, an inch or two this way or that way, but generally 21 inches is, is the standard for the royal cubit. That means that Og would have been more like somewhere between uh, 12 and 15 feet tall, depending on which cubit that you're going to use there. And the bed had to be an iron bed because his weight was too heavy because of his width and, and total weight uh, would have crushed a wooden bed. And then in the time of Goliath, we get his dimensions, and he's said to be eight feet tall in, in churches. Well, that, that makes no sense, but that's because, again, they're trying to diminish it. He is six cubits and a span, and he is a Gittite from Gath. And what I mentioned earlier is, is that the Rephaim were the kings. So he's, he's from the royal family, if not the king of Gath. And that's also why I think David took five stones, because the Philistine pentapolis of kings were all there. That's five cities of the uh, Philistines with their kings there, with their Rephaim rulers. And I think he was prepared to kill all five kings that day if he had to. But he only had to use one, and that started the rout uh, against the uh, Philistines that day. And so Goliath would have been anywhere from nine feet, nine inches to um, 11 feet, three inches. And because he's of royal bloodlines, I would expect he was you know, more like the 11 foot mark. So that now is a daunting figure. If you look at what science is telling us, whether it's totally accurate or not, I'll leave that up for everybody else. But the, the average person was five to five and a half feet about that time. So it would, Goliath would have been twice as tall and about six times the weight. I got a question about the uh, Goliath thing here. This is wonderful that you said that because the reason they want to diminish the size of these giants is to say, see, it's just a genetic anomaly like that yes. Robert down over in England that was that tall. Well, these weren't weaklings that had to hold themselves up on canes. They were, like you said, their bone struck, it was just, they were like twice as thick, weren't they? And they had thicker yep. skulls and thicker everything. So, well, you have these you know, elongated skulls, right? That are way bigger than a human skull. And you can't, you can bind a child's skull and make it elongated, but you can't increase the cranial capacity. And these were yes. significantly bigger, and they don't have sutures. All human skulls have sutures. They're of a, of a different species. And this was a look that would give them very high cheekbones and a sort of long, slender sort of uh, jaw going down towards the chin. And they had large opening for eyes that were a bit wraparound. So if you wanted to look at what a diluted Raphaim would have looked like, Google the you know Akhenaten of you know King Tut's time and look at one of his statues, and you're going to see this serpentine-like face. That's because the Watchers were the seraphim angels that I talked about. Seraphim, I am plural, the serpent ones, as they're defined. They had faces of serpents, or still do. Um, and when they took a physical body, that required a DNA to create that, to be able to have sex, and that was passed on. So you have the serpentine look being passed on to these giants. 
parts. So they were horrible to look on. And their voices would, you know, they describe it in, in Greek mythology as Atlas, you know, bellowing from the bowels of Hades and vibrating the world. I mean, their fear, their, their sound of their voices, the look of their faces, their smell, were, they were the terrible ones to look at and they did terrible things to, to, the, to the human race. So you have this serpentine imagery all around the world in prehistory, both before and after the flood. That's not a coincidence. That's because those were the governing angels. Those were the watchers. And if people are saying, well, watchers not in, isn't in the Bible, yes, it is. It's in Daniel 4 three times. And those angels are setting down uh, from God as loyal seraphim angels, not all seraphim rebelled. And they have instructions of kingship and rule because that was part of the job of the seraphim as well as the religious aspect because the seraphim, as in Isaiah 6 talks about, were the fiery serpent ones who worked before the altar in the fiery stones and they actually take one of those stones out to take the sin away like a priest would for Isaiah and they're working before the altar. That's the second part of what they're responsible for which makes sense that the watchers then would have that hierarchy set up of not only the priest class but the warrior class and the ruling class because two of those are what the watchers were responsible for. And then it's the mighty, mighty angels which would be in charge and the archangels, the rebellious ones which would be in charge of the warrior class. And so you have this imagery of ancient and prehistorical kings that have the serpent look as they're described uh, and their gods are serpents. So you have that as a common look described all around the world, but there are other ones that you do, that you were talking about, like the Cyclops. But in the Bible, we also get the lion men of Moab, who were mighty warriors. And those lion men are another kind of Nephilim. And they're created by angels in, or gods in polytheism like Nergal, who looked like a lion, or Mahat in, in Egypt. And they procreated as well and created lion-like Nephilim. And there are other ones as well, but those are the two that we can directly take back to the Bible. But you have the Anunnaki, who you know are shown in Sumerian inscriptions and things, and they have a bird-like face, just as Horus is a falcon or a bird or a raven so it's part of their allegories and you have beings that are called the tengu in southeast asia mm -hmm. they were recent that. yeah and i have a again i have a document on the tengu if people want that um, and they look just like these anunnaki gods and you have the zabalba in the kishamaya which were their giants. And the Zabalba were bird-like demigods as well. And what's really interesting as well is there's a branch of the Zabalba called the Camazots, and that's the house of the bats. And if you Google... I've never heard of that. you got to tell me some more. you, you, you got to talk some more on that. The, the, this one group, I've never heard that. The name, Zim, Zim, how'd you say it? Zabalba. They're, out of the, they're, they're written oh. about in, in the Popol Vuh. The, the holy book of okay, the okay, that's what I, I got right? you. Okay. But the Kamazots, if you Google Kamazots, C-A-M-A-Z-O-T-Z, -A -A -Z, you're going to get this picture that comes up that looks like Batman's outfit. So Wow. <laughs> wow. And, 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 but of course, all the superheroes are, for the most part, based on mm -hmm. the Nephilim, right? So that would make some sense. And so you've got all these sort of different kinds. And you also have, you have to be aware of Anubis and Anub has as he's as a god of the Avim are described in, in the book of Kings, Second Kings, who which was uh, depicted as a dog or a jackal. And then that now brings in the dogmen that if they procreated, and of course in polytheism they did, so you even had a whole city of Anubis's mm -hmm. offspring of dog warriors. And these were mercenary warriors that were around and have many historical accounts through history, right up even till after the time of Jesus. 
um, of these dog warrior creatures. And again, I have a great document on the uh, three-part series on, on the dogmen um, that looks at what the Bible has to talk about dogs. Is there a connection there? There's a few, but it sort of fits completely in with that whole concept of these different kinds of, of Nephilim. And what's interesting is, is the mercenary dogmen seem to be at the lower lowest level of the Nephilim sort of hierarchy. And what's interesting is you go back to Goliath again, and when he sees David, who's just this young boy coming at him, and he says, what am I, a dog? I think he's <laughs> saying, what do you think I am? Just some lowly dog Nephilim? No, I'm right. Raphaim, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> That's you um I, I wanted to ask you about that uh i want you to actually go into that a little more depth i'm taking notes as you go so i won't forget uh but there you we were talking about david and goliath and uh i had read uh the possibility of this and i want to ask you i cannot remember if i asked you this before so forgive me if i if i have but uh there was you know, the, there's the story where, you know, David buried the skull of Goliath. But some people have surmised that possibly David buried Goliath's skull actually on Golgotha, the place of the skull. Not because it, uh, just because it looked like the skull, the actual mountain, but because it fulfills, it, it, a, in a literal sense, you shall crush the head of the serpent. The, 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 his seed you know, the prophecy in Genesis. So uh, when he was crucified on Golgotha, if David buried the the uh, skull there, it would literally have been under his feet and his crucifixion would have been literally uh, crushing him. So yeah. I, I have never heard that before. Yeah. Had you heard that? I, I, I have heard that. And there's definitely, when you look at the Hebrew words, there's a connection in the words, but I've not, you know, been able to make sort of an etym etymological connection based on the words, but they're definitely related. If David did bury Goliath's skull in uh, in, in Golgotha Hill, uh, then he would have had to have done it later in life. So he would have had to have kept the skull or knew where it was because Jerusalem wasn't taken until he was an adult and, and, and captured Jerusalem. So there's certainly a possibility because it's within his lifetime, but I've got no research to be able to sort of say, here's the coincidences and, and did it happen? And is that why there's such a close association of the Hebrew words? Well, you know, I think one of the main problems people have with accepting this as literal this really happened i know it's out there i know it's it's intense it's supernatural uh but they don't get you know they they think when jesus said the angels aren't given marriage means that they can't well the fallen ones did all he's saying is that there's no need for marriage in heaven but right. the, the point i'm making is they came and you mentioned this earlier these beings took on physical form. They had to have the physical body and they took, like Jude talks about, left their habitation. I want you to explain that word too in Greek. But sure. they, they can't understand how a yep. spiritual entity could do something physical. But we see them eating and sitting down and eating yep. with, yep. with uh, God Abraham and and in Adam and Gore, they wanted to, to, to rape the angels. So, I mean, it, it's not, it's just, it's there in the scriptures if you're looking for it. But I think well, you, that's the big jump people have to get over is that these yeah. things came in physical form. Yeah. yeah. And and marriage isn't required in heaven. And you, you need to read the Luke version. It gives you a better description that after we're raised, we're going to be like angels and there's no need for marriage in right. heaven. That's the realm of the spirit beings. But we get, as you mentioned, a, a lot of counts scripturally of angels who take a physical form all sorts of different physical forms throughout the bible they eat they touch they they are in a physical um uh, body in those accounts in, the, in 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 the bible that you talked about and they fight the sword yeah they yeah. so what so what that tells us is, is they can create a physical body and interact with the world so 
what's going on here is you take that back to Jude 1 6 where they left their habitation um, you get that word habitation that goes back to the Greek word oikotarian and oikotarian means a dwelling place for the spirit so they left their heavenly dwelling place for their spirit in heaven and they came to the earth and in, on the earth they're going to need a dwelling place for that spirit which is the body and the soul that's why we're told there's a spirit body and a soul the soul and the body are of the physical world the spirit is of the heavenly realm and in second corinthians 5 we get oikotarian used one more time as the house in heaven and it's talking about you know the clothes of heaven and the clothes of, of, uh, of, of the earth. So there's two different types of dwelling places for the spirit. And one's required for heaven and one's required for um, the physical world. And that heavenly house, I think, is a word that is used because when Jesus talks, he says, I have many rooms in my mansion in heaven right that's the heavenly house that's the spirit that is is reserved the and the place and the dwelling place reserved for your spirit um in heaven because you believe in jesus and in god and the holy spirit and so you have to have a dwelling place for the spirit and they have the ability to create this physical body for that dwelling place for the spirit and that makes sense when you look at what happens with Jesus is that this is not an incarnation that we talked about earlier. This is the Word made flesh. So the Holy Spirit comes upon Mary and he creates the start of the growth of the soul and the body to house the Word who becomes flesh. That's the Spirit. And that is who Jesus is, and that there's no sex. There's, uh, as in, you know, polytheist accounts, there is just this this dwelling place for Jesus to um, enter into, to interact in the world, to become physical so that he can uh, complete his commission and be crucified. And of course, if the angels had anticipated, as Corinthians talks about, the resurrection, they would have ensured he wasn't crucified. So they didn't know uh, everything that God had in mind because he's Alpha Omega and he's allow everything to play out through free choice and there's no way that angels who are creation of God can outsmart the omnipotent one so he's Alpha Omega angels are not and so you need uh, a body to uh, procreate and that's why you have to have DNA to be able to procreate and that's why the nephilim would look after would look similar to the physical form of the angel that he took in the physical world and that would have been passed on through the the mothers that they mated with so this also all makes sense if you understand what's going on in terms of the language and that and that to me it was really sort of cracked open with understanding that word oikotarian which is the dwelling place for the spirit and it also makes sense for the bodiless spirits of the giants which are the demons that they want to interact in the world because they're like in dry places and they're like thirsting and, a, and they want a place of rest and the only place they can interact in the world and get rest is by possessing a human and suppressing the human spirit and that's why it's not a symbiotic relationship and so they're always roaming uh, looking to inhabit a body because they need a dwelling place for their spirit and their spirit didn't die wasn't permitted to sleep and it wasn't permitted to go to heaven so they roam the earth and again i have a great document on how we know the demons are the bodiless spirits of, uh, of of the giants if people want to get a hold of me yes i i was really surprised to hear a, a pastor recently not understand that or at least not believe it because uh, i don't know why it's it's difficult i think it's an easy concept to see why else would they be disembodied uh, they were that's part of the judgment they they were not supposed yep. to be here they're down on earth they're not in heaven there's nowhere for them to go yet until judgment and so their their temporary position is to just be 
uh, floating around without a body. And that yep. makes a lot of sense why they're seeking a, a home. You know, yep. Jesus said you can't. Uh, they, 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 are, they are reprobate counterfeit spirits. Yeah. So, I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. Also, without understanding that you know, this concept of the event that happened on Mount Hermon, there is you're going to miss, I think, a lot of uh, details in the scripture, such as, you know, because if people aren't familiar with the story in Enoch, that the angels fell at Mount Hermon. That's where they made the oath with one another that they would do this thing, that they would uh, have children of their own and, and come in a physical form and, and mate with women and create children. And that is where Jesus is standing when uh, um, Peter, he asked him, who do men say that I am? And he says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed are thou, Simon of Barjona. Uh, uh, flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but Father in heaven. So he says, and on this rock, I'll build my church. And we know that, you know, Jesus is the rock. He is, Christ is that rock. As Paul says that Moses struck, it's a picture of living water coming out of the rock. And that's, Jesus and uh, the Holy Spirit, um, and we we can see that picture clearly. But if you don't get what happened at Mount Hermon when he says the and on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, he's standing right there at a gate of I mean it, like a almost a virtual gate a, a portal. To hell the gates of hell because that's what the enemies are they came through that place and the, the serpent seed of the serpent is kind of developed there that's the beginning of them manifesting in these forms as giants it's where it all starts and i think you there that you don't understand the magnitude of the flood and why it was necessary I think there's a lot of things we can miss if we don't understand Genesis 6. And this is, I think it's really important. And I get bashed a lot because by independent fundamental Baptists and my local church is independent fundamental Baptist. So it's, you know, my, my, my pastor believes it. He believes Genesis 6 is literal, like it says. Uh, and a, a few others do too, that I've heard. I'm very happy. I think you and Steve Quayle and Marzuli, you have all really enlightened people into looking and seeking the scriptures on this issue. And I, I think it's a very, very, very strong case. I think the other, the other view really, uh, you know, doesn't doesn't work, and you miss a lot of it. So I think it's important that we, we understand this concept. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask you, you go ahead and. Uh, well, well, I would I, I would add on to that that you can't understand what happened before the flood unless you understand who the Nephilim were. You can't understand history after the flood, what was going on at Babel, uh, what was going on in the time of Abraham, the war of giants in Genesis 14. You can't understand the Exodus. You can't understand how our history has been affected unless you understand who the giants are and who they were today. And if you're trying to understand prophecy, you have to understand prehistories because so much of the allegory and the meaning and is is based in prehistory but prophecy end time prophecy is the resolution to those events that took place in prehistory starting with the angelic rebellion and then on you know with other events like what happened in eden what happened uh, in genesis 6 it's the denouement to to that whole rebellion and the second revenge to try and ensure humankind would not be raised up to be like angels in the future time. Um, it was designed to justify the rebellion because if they could have the ones who chose God by choice before given immortality, unlike the fallen angels, then they believe they could win their own realm. 
They knew they knew they they knew they couldn't defeat God. They were always trying to have a realm on their own, so Satan could be like God, but away from God and God's oversight. And that's what they're going to try and deceive humans in in the end time to try and fight for, is to to have that realm. And they're going to try and convince humans you can fight against the evil God of the Bible. But if you don't understand what was going on with the Raphaim nations and what Israel was doing in uh, the Exodus and the conquest of the covenant land, you, you miss the whole story of what's going on there. And then you're more easily susceptible to deception in that saying, hey, that is the evil God. That's the same God who uh, caused the flood. That's the same God who had all of these innocent people butchered in the land of the covenant. You see how they plant those seeds and then build on it. Once they get that wedge door open, they can kick it wide open with a whole bunch of other things. And the whole thing is right from the creation of the mystical religions is to lead people away from God. Right. Oh, and to yeah. not give God credit for anything, to degrade God and to honor their pantheon of gods. And that comes through in the sciences, which come out of the seven sacred sciences, which created the mystical religions of Enoch. You know, he, he's, uh, he's made himself look like he's the advocate for humanity. Like, I, was, I wanted you guys to have knowledge. I was on your side. Yeah. And so, and, and God's an evil God, like Blavatsky wrote. And had it all backwards. And you're right. There's just a little, all you have to do. And I can't tell you how many unbelievers have said this, that God's a tyrant. He's a kid with an ant farm that likes to just play with people's lives and just indiscriminately kills people. And look, he was a mass murderer, a genocidal maniac in the Old Testament. And that's exactly what it looks like if you don't know what's going on there. Yeah. You know? and, and you won't understand why we're warned in the new testament that satan masquerades as an angel of light or it's right or why uh saul god was the spirit left saul because he wouldn't kill someone yeah wow that's that's a shock well people, and and, and if, if you didn't understand that uh a gag is the king that saul was told to kill uh was had an patronymic title uh, that was passed down through the ages for the Amalekite hybrid nation that came from Timna, Ahorim, and um, Eliphaz, son of Esau, um, and, and that Timna as being Ahorim is Rephaim, it's a branch of the Rephaim, that this was a nation that was trying to wipe Israel from the face of the earth, which is why they attacked them as soon as Israel left Egypt when they weren't ready. They had no weapons. They had no ability to make weapons. They were a ragtag collection of, of, of slaves that the Amalekites attacked them at that time to wipe them from the face of the earth. Why? So that they could inherit the birthright that Jacob received, that they could inherit the blessings that Jacob received, that they could inherit the promise of the Messiah to bring, along, bring about their dragon Messiah and inherit the land of the covenant um, by wiping Israel from the face of the earth. And in Numbers, you also get another king, Agag there, who is having his kingdom and his power compared to uh, the, the coming Messiah kingdom. That's how powerful these Amalekites were. They were one of the powerhouses of the ancient world who attacked Israel when they were fleeing from Egypt. I mean, and that's, and, and it was so poorly looked upon that even though they didn't destroy the Amalekites at the time of the conquest, it was put down that once you have a monarchy that that is what you're supposed to do. And when they swore, King Saul swore the oath of, of taking the kingship that went with all of the um, warrior aspects and military covenants that were part of the kingship um, and was also told to complete what was commanded by God at the time of the Exodus to attack the Amalekites and wipe them from the face of the earth, he refused to do it. I mean, he attacked them, but he didn't go all the way. 
David right. took care of the job, but still some, some Amalekites still survived. So when you get down in the time of Esther, the Amalekites, again, they're trying to wipe the remnant of Judah from the face of the earth with Hamath, yep. the Agagite. Agagite goes back to that patronymic term. And this is not just somebody who is a mystery person. This is a renowned king of the bloodline who is set above all the other princes of the vassal conquered states of Persia, second only to the king of Persia, who is trying to write Judah from the face of the earth. And if he didn't have this ennobled bloodline, this long descendant who calls himself an Agagite would not have had that prestigious position because he had no country. That's so how ennobled that. that bloodline was. I am so glad you said that. I have so many, and I did not research it enough. I'm telling you, this is one of those things where you just know something and you don't know why you know it. But I, I said, I, I know that this, I think it was the Haman, uh, right? Was Who was the one that was trying to kill the Jews in Esther? Was it ha Hamath. Haman? Hamath. Oh, he, he uh, I even said, I think it goes back to that king. And if he was done what he was supposed to do, then they wouldn't in peril again because God saw the end from the beginning. And so you just put them together and that's exactly what my gut was on that. I really do believe that. Uh, and I think it repeats over and over again. Like we'll keep seeing these uh, antichrist figures come up to destroy over and over again. Yeah. 